Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, the next uh, group offer writing workshop for the Masterclass Elite for the M Multifamily Investing Academy. Got it all out there. All right, this is Charles Dobbins. And my disclaimer, I am an attorney. I'm not your attorney. Get an attorney. Um, th and th this is going to be about an hour-long discussion. And then for those of you that are in the uh, first ever Owners Forum uh, class, uh, that is going to be at 6 o'clock tonight, and uh, looking forward to that, seeing how that all works out. But uh, if you want any more information on that, just shoot me an email, and exp I'll explain it to you. Uh, okay, t today we're talking about a very uh, particular type of offer. And this particular discussion is going to be a little bit different because I'm not going to discuss really the income and expenses. I'm not going to get into that component of it. Uh, otherwise, we'd be here all night. So I'm just going to take the offers, uh, the property packages, at their face value and, and say if that's the NOI, then, then that's the NOI. Um, the thing that we're going to be stressing here right today is how to make an offer on, a, on an assumption, how to put the debt numbers into the cash flow analyzer on an assumption, uh, and then also, uh, finally, um, some of the things that you must have in your offer if you're making an offer on a an assumption all right there are two specific things that your offer must have your offer must have this don't come to the to the table during the negotiation of the purchase and sale agreement and start asking for these things then the 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 horse has already left the the, the barn train has already left the station they're going to look at you and say wait a minute we never agreed to this. Why didn't you ask for this during the LOI stage? So make sure that your letter of intent includes these two particular paragraphs uh, so that you don't get yourself caught. Remember, my, my motto in many instances is always remain in control of the deal. And if you do not have these two paragraphs in your offer and they get translated into the purchase and sale agreement, you could lose control of the offer. And that's not what you want to have happen. Okay, let me just check to make sure that uh, people are all on. Oh, Vance already has a question. Are you sharing slides? Um, Vance, can you, s oh, I'm sorry, folks, now can you see my screen? Can everyone see my screen now? Thanks, Vance. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I thought I'd, I'd click the little button. Okay, so what I was looking at is Landlord Cash Flow Analyzer. There you go. All right, so let's start talking basically about the you know how do you approach a um, an assumption? Here's what's what it's going to look like. Uh, let me just jump over to I believe it's this one right here. Yeah. Okay. So let's say for instance you're looking at this 14 unit property in Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. Everything looks fine. It's you know it's only six hundred ten thousand dollars. It's a 14 unit property. Um, and you decide you can start reading a little bit about the investment highlights and. We talk about the cap, 8.4 cap, fully renovated property, 100% um, occupied with highly screened tenants, many rents guaranteed by HUD or the VA. Now, it says right here that the current lender is ready to offer a loan assumption or a new loan for qualified buyers. Now, that's, that's not typical. You don't tend to see the lender giving you a choice or the seller giving you a choice. In this particular case, the current lender is, is basically saying, hey, yeah, sure, we like this property, we like this, this business, we would like to stay on this risk, and so therefore, if someone new comes in, we will give you, we'll let you assume the existing uh, mortgage. But if you don't like the existing mortgage and you want to get your own, we're not going to penalize the seller. There is no um, punitive prepayment penalty in this deal, so uh, we hope that you come with us but you can go out and get your own paper uh, if you want. And that is, uh, you know, that kind of tells you that um, this, is an, this is not a true negative, I mean, true assumption. I, 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 think, negatives, I think assumptions are pretty much negative, uh, and you'll see why in a moment. But in this particular case, it's kind of like, hey, we want you to stay, but uh, if you don't want to, we're not going to penalize the seller with prepayment penalties. So go out and get your own paper. So this one is a little bit different in that regard. And the other, the other issue about that, this particular property, 
when you're talking about assumptions, is I couldn't find anywhere in here that it tells me what's going on with the existing note. See, for us to do the cash flow analyzer correctly, we're going to need to know what the outstanding debt amount is, what the amortization period is, what the interest rate is, um, all of that, that information so that we can plug that into our, our uh, cash flow analyzer and then figure out exactly uh, what, the, you know, what the purchase price should be. As you can see, I'm just scrolling through here. And lots of pretty pictures, lots of pretty articles, but nothing on what I need to know. So if I was to do this deal, I would go and, and, and put it into my cash flow analyzer as if it was a new money purchase. But then once I, you know, once I got it in there, I'd contact the broker and say, hey, you mentioned something about an assumption. What are the terms of the deal that I would be assuming? And as you can see, that's it. I just went through the whole entire property package. They mentioned assumptions in there uh, just at the beginning, uh, but other than that, there's nothing in there. All right, so that's not a great and uh, a great property package. But I wanted to show you uh, one of the differences. Now, let's jump on over to this one right here. This property looks like. Can can anyone guess before I go any further what state this this uh, property is in? I'm going to wait to see the the answers pop up. What what uh, state? Anyone that's been looking at properties for as long as I have, you take one look at this property, and you know exactly what state it's in because they all look the same. Let me see. Anybody? Anybody? Not North Carolina? No. Nope, no. Nope, no. Nope. Georgia? No. Nope, not Georgia. Come on, you guys. Come on. You should know this one. California, no. Oh, now you're just guessing, Mike Butler. No, this one uh, definitely can't. No, no, want to come on. It's uh, look at this pitch roof, separate entrances, uh, all balconies. Got these fa these chimneys with real fireplaces. But people, because it's so warm where this place is, all they do is they put their couches up against the fireplace. Uh, so it looks great on the outside, but it never gets used. All right, the the correct answer is Texas. Every property in Texas looks the same. They were all built in the 1980s. Oh my gosh, it just goes on and on and on. So watch, watch me. I'll, I will have got it wrong. I will have forgotten. Chancellors in yeah, Houston, Texas. Oh my gosh, these properties all look the same. So here we have a property with KET Enterprises. That's a pretty big brokerage house. If you're looking in Texas, you definitely want to get on their mailing list. All right. Note the price for this property. The price for this property is market price. In other words, they're not going to set a price. If they talk, the first person that talks price loses, so they don't even want to mention price. So we're going to need to figure out what this property is worth based upon the numbers they give us. Now, here's the big problem. It's offered on an assumption only. Remember that first one? You could either do it as an assumption or you'd have to get new money. This one, you don't have a choice. The only way that you're going to be able to buy this property is if you assume the existing mortgage. Why is that? Because the existing mortgage has huge uh, defeasance fees, defeasance penalties, prepayment penalties uh, is another term for it. And let me tell you something, folks. It's huge. So that's one of the problems with these types of mortgages. You have to assume the mortgage so that the existing seller doesn't get hit with huge prepayment fees. Well, guess what happens when you take over this property? And now it's your turn to have to sell it. You have to be able to sell it only on, the, you're only going to be able to sell it on an, on an assumption basis only because of those defeasance penalties. So you either got to live out the length of this mortgage or when you come to sell it, you've got to find some other sucker who's going to take on the assumption. And I say sucker because I, so many people come into, this, into an assumption mindset like, like, oh, we're going to assume this mortgage. What a great thing. This seller is doing us a huge favor by giving us this mortgage with great terms. Well, actually, you're doing him a huge favor because you are taking one of your negotiating tools, which is the terms of a mortgage, off the table and basing it upon what somebody else did, what somebody else negotiated a few years back and hoping that it's a good deal. So you're, and if you don't assume it, you're not buying this property. And if 
this guy can't find somebody to assume it, he can't sell. So I'm telling you right now that, that the way you need to approach an assumption is not that the seller is doing you any favors. You have to approach an assumption like you are doing the seller a huge favor. You're taking over his prepayment penalties because those are going to become yours. All right? Now let's just hold down here a little bit. All right, and then let's see. Where is the wording that I'm looking for? Let me scroll down a little bit more. All right, here. Now, let's talk about this particular page in the light of the cash flow analyzer. This is, this is the deal. The mortgage balance is 6.195, so you will be assuming a $6.2 million interest-only property. Now, that's not quite the case, but we'll come back to that in a moment. The interest rate is 5.07. That's not a great rate. You can do better than that, especially in a $6 million deal. So you're now looking at, at a higher than market interest rate. Who, who benefits from that? Only the bank. You don't. Well, why can't you go out and get a, a more competitive uh, interest rate? You can't. You have to assume this one. So, so much for the seller. He is now selling a property that is not market competitive or he's going to have to pay the prepayment penalty, and he won't do it. Now, check this out. The due date is 2024. So it's essentially maybe a, a um, it's about a 10-year, let's assume, and we'd have to get this clarified, let's assume that it, it's a 10-year term. So in other words, this guy took this mortgage out just about a year ago. That's if it's a 10-year term, maybe a 15-year term. I may be totally off. Uh, estimated reserve for replacement per unit, 250. Folks, let me highlight this. Oh, I highlighted everything. Let me highlight this one more time. This is very, very important in an assumption offer. You will see how I take care of this in the LOI, but I want you to focus on this particular section for a moment. Think about what, uh, what a, um, a replacement reserve is. That is, uh, every time he makes a mortgage payment, $250 per unit per year gets, gets put on the top of his mortgage payment and gets set aside in a bank account. And that money has to be used for capital improvements. And if it is never used, what happens to it at the closing table on an assumption? Here's what happens. Let's say, for instance, that this guy has been setting aside $250 per unit per year for you know, five years. Let's say that reserve replacement account, and he's never touched it, and that reserve replacement account now has $100,000 in it. There's $100,000 that this guy has not spent on his property from the replacement reserves for the last five years. And you come to the closing table. What's going to happen to that $100,000? Here's what's going to happen. The bank is going to cut a check for the 100000 and give it to the seller. Then they're going to turn to you and say, where's your 100 And you're going to say, well, wait a minute. I, I, I don't have the $100,000. It, I don't need to set it aside. That's money that he should have spent on the property. That money should be kept in the deal. Well, I'm sorry, but the purchase and sale contract doesn't speak to that at all. If anything... You and you know what? We don't really care where the money comes from. The fact is that that hundred thousand dollars has to be spent on this property in order to protect our collateral. So, if you're going to take over this on this on assumption, and we just cut how much for a hundred, we need a hundred thousand dollars to put back in that account, and it's coming out of your hide. So, what you're going to do in the offer is say the the reserve replacement fund has to be spent down to zero by the closing or whatever is in there gets transferred to the new owner. That's it. Otherwise, here you are doing this guy a favor, and he just stuck it to you for 100000 bucks. That means you've got to go out and find more investors into your deal for that $100,000. And you've got to put this wording in at the LOI stage, not asking for it at the purchase and sale stage. And you've got to have this wording in there, because at the closing table, you don't want the bank, you know, two days before uh, you're set to close, and you get the, you think you've got it all figured out, and you get the closing statement, and it says you've got to come up with an extra hundred thousand dollars. You are going to be having a bad day. I'll tell you that right now. So get it taken care of in the LOI stage. 
Now, the other thing that we want to look at on here is the this little blue comment. Interest only first three years, then it's going to amortize. So this this monthly payment, this 20, 26, 174, that doesn't include any NEP. That's just I. And so in two years, this 26 is going to go up. So when we're sitting there figuring out our numbers from um, from on the cash flow analyzer, I'm going to I'm going to stick in a 30 year AM. I'm not going to do an interest only. I'm going to put in a 30 year AM right from day one and leave it at that. All right. So and the other thing too, remember this is Texas. This is Texas. Remember it's a non disclosure state, so we don't know what the taxes are going to be. But let's take a look at this information over here. The tax rate in 2014 was 2.77708. The 2015 preliminary tax assessment is just at 7.1. The uh, that means the estimated future tax assessment that they're using for their for their calculations is 8.1. So right there, they have kind of told you what the price of the property they think it's going to be, and it might be actually 80 percent of what they're saying. It might be 10 million. So we know the market price for this property is between 8 and 10 million. All right. So just keep that in mind as we go to go to uh, figure this out. Now, let me just show you. I'm not going to get into the whole thing about brokers and, and what have you. Um, I got in trouble last time because <laughs> it's a broker on the call, and I'm so sorry, buddy. Okay. Check this out. Pro forma. We all know what pro forma means. That's Latin for pretend. And then over here under modified actuals. Why can't you just give me the actuals? Why do you have to give me modified? You know, when you start playing name games like that, you, you're, you're parsing words like what, what is the definition of is is type of thing. All right, so here's what I'm going to do just to keep this moving. Is the only number that I want out of this deal is this NOI, the eight, the eight seven eight nine twenty seven. Okay, I'm just gonna write that down so I can come back to that eight seven eight nine twenty seven. Um, and uh, let me see. Um, so let's go back over here to the cash flow analyzer, and you're going to see how I figure this out. First thing I'm going to do is go into input data screen. We're going to enter the rent roll. Okay, so what we're going to say is that there's going to be one unit, and the, the um, monthly rent on that one unit is, and understand, guys, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not doing a full income and expense uh, thing, and you're going to see why this is crazy to begin with, 73243. All right, that is the monthly rent because it gives us right up there the eight seven eight nine one six number. Uh, so I now have the, the the top number on income. I'm going to set the revenue. I'm going to set the vacancy rate at zero. And so our top line number. I'm going to jump over to the expenses and I'm going to put a zero for the expenses. So right away I know based upon the cash flow analyzer, my NOI is eight seventy eight. So. I've, I've just built this analysis for, for the uh, interest of time. I've built this uh, cash flow so that the NOI is mirrors what they're saying the NOI is. Now, let's jump back over here to uh, and start filling in some of these blanks here. The contract purchase price, let's do that $8 million. That $8.1 million that they think that the taxes are going to be assessed at uh, going forward. I'm not going to put in anything for initial improvements. Um, you know, I'm not going to put anything for closing costs. I'm going to just keep this really simple. Now, I scroll down here. What was the cap rate that he said it was? Does anybody remember off the top of their heads? Oh, that's another one. That was the one I was going to look at. Um, and hold on a second. Um, let's see here. Where's his cap rate? Hmm. Hold on, folks. There we go. Okay. Uh, they were, oh, check this out. Uh, valuation, cap rate, nothing. They didn't put a number in there. Cash and cash return, they didn't have that. But they didn't put in the cap rate because once they did, if they put in the cap rate and they told you what the NOI was, you should easily be able to figure out what the market price is. So they're not going to help you figure out the purchase price. They want you to do it on your own. So we don't know. And I, I personally do not know what the cap rate is for a property like this. Uh, in Houston, Texas, is you know we can go back and just throw in a um, a number. You know, let's say it's it, let's say it's six percent. Um, 
six percent operating fall. Okay, so now here's the issue. Remember, and this is the difference with an assumption. When you purchase a property and you need to figure out how much money you need to come to the table with, it's typically a based upon a percentage of the purchase price. You see, you're going to go out to the to the banks and get a loan that is 80% LTV, loan to value. That means you've got to come up with 20% of the of the purchase price as your down payment. The problem with an assumption is that it doesn't work that way. The amount of the mortgage is no longer a percentage of what you've negotiated. The amount of the mortgage is now set and it doesn't change. And there are times when guys are out there trying to move deals on an assumption basis where the outstanding debt amount is equal to 50% of the purchase price, which means that instead of you coming to the table with with 20% down, you've now got to come to the table with 50% down. And you're like, wait a minute, that's going to kill my cash on cash return numbers. Why would I ever buy a property where I have to come to the table with 50% down? That's not good for me. For With 50% of the money, I can go somewhere else and buy a whole lot more property with the same amount of money. So there's another example of why an assumption can, can may not be a good deal. Now, in this particular case, remember what we said, we knew that the, the outstanding uh, mortgage balance was 6195. I'm going to go take that number and I'm going to stick it in right here. 6195. No. 6195. No. 6195. There we go. All right. Now we knew the interest rate was 5.07. So we're going to put the 5.07 in here. And you know we're going to put the thirty the, the amortization at three sixty at thirty years. It's uh, I'm not going to dick around with the interest only and then try to figure it out. I'm just not doing it. See what happens to the mortgage payment. The mortgage payment is now at thirty three thousand, up from the um, twenty six thousand. So now you're spending about another seven thousand dollars a month in in principal payments when when the property begins to amortize. So you got to think about that when you're when you're putting this whole thing together. Okay. So, what does that mean to us at 8.1 million? How does the property look? I'm going to jump on over to here. And at 8 million, we're looking at a debt coverage ratio of 2.18. We're looking at a um, you know, cash on cash return about 25%. Uh, you know, so right away we're looking at a pretty good, um, pretty good deal. So I think that the property. Let's go back over here to the input stage. What happens is, is at the six percent cap, this property is actually valued at fourteen million, based upon the NOI that they said. So as you can see, uh, at that valuation, obviously this is a, a pretty good deal. Now watch what happens, guys. Watch what happens. If I have to bring this property value up, let's say I'm going to offer $12 million on this. When I offer $12 million and I've got a $6 million mortgage, that means I've got to come up with about $6 million. bucks. I've now got to come up with $6 million down in order to make this deal happen. So let's take a look at what happens to this property at on the cash flow analyzer won't we'll change it to a twelve million dollar valuation. All right, the debt coverage ratio still remains very nice. Now look at the cash and cash return. It's now eight point two one. Big difference because we had to come up with a whole lot more money. So you're thinking to yourself, geez, you know, this is great. I can go out and I can assume this deal. Well the deal's worth twelve million or four, even more, it might be worth fourteen million. And I can't get to that number. I can't, you know, I, I've got to come up with 50% down in order to make it work. That's not going to work. I've got to go out and raise an awful lot. Think about how much property you can buy at $6 million if you're doing an 80% LTV. So how does the seller solve this problem? Let me show you how he does it. All right, take a look at this particular property. This is a Bristol. Apartments in Indianapolis, Indiana, in Indianapolis, Indiana, 211 units. Let me just show you some wording in here that is very, very important. 
Okay, check this out down here, the Bristol overview. Look at this last paragraph. The purchase of the Bristol offers the assumption of a very attractive in-place Fannie Mae loan with 3.86% interest rate. Okay, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. You'd want to grab that interest rate. And a maturity date of December 1st, 2022. So it's probably a 10-year term taken out in, in uh, 2012. Now, here's the line that you need to understand. In addition, the potential exists to add a Fannie supplemental loan to increase leverage to a 75% LTV. What does that mean? That's what we call in the business ratcheting. What they're saying that you can do is because this property has appraised so much in the last two years, for instance, it, you now would have to put down a lot more than 25% down to buy this property. But Fannie Mae and the seller realize that, hey, if we force you to have to put more down, we have now turned our deal. Our deal does not look as attractive as it did before. So instead of doing making you buy it at the existing outstanding uh, debt amount, we're going to increase the debt on the property up to 75% of your purchase price. So you only need to come to the table with 25% down. Now remember, that last deal we looked at, for that to work, it's going to look like a 50%. Uh, you're going to have to come up with 50%. If that particular bank allows ratcheting, you might be able to increase the amount of that debt to $10 million and then only have to come up with $2 million as opposed to $6 million. That's what's called ratcheting. Now what happens is the way it works from a technical standpoint is all Fannie Mae is doing is they're keeping the existing mortgage in place and they're putting a second mortgage on top of that first one at current rates. So here the rate is 3.86. If the current rate is 4.1, you're going to get a second mortgage at 4.1. And what we do in our calculations is we create a blended interest rate between the two notes and we come up with it with a, with a blended interest rate uh, that we work with in the cash flow analyzer. All right, so does everyone see that? Let me just check the questions, see if anybody has any questions on this. Oh, I got some questions. Hold on a second. All right, North Carolina. All right, hold on a second, Casey. Let me get to the question. Can this alone assumption requirement be a good negotiating tool for me against the seller to bargain better terms on the other aspect of the deal? Yes. This, an assumption, what, what, the way I've always seen it played is that the brokers come to you and try to say, hey, this is an assumption deal. It's got great terms. You better grab it. And you say, what are you kidding me? These terms are terrible. I want to go out and get my own uh, note. Well, you can't. You have to take this one. Well, I don't, uh, you know, then you start going back with the broker and say, listen, this is a good deal for me. You know, and, and that's a problem with these brokers. They, they try to make, try to, obviously, they're trying to sell the deal and they're trying to make the, the loan assumption seem like a good deal. Here's what you need to understand. And this is crucial. And this is the thing that nobody tells you. And you find out the hard way. Trust me, folks. This isn't professional speaking. This is also my personal, personal side speaking. When you enter into an assumption deal, there are three people at the negotiating table. It's you and the seller and the bank. And the bank has no concern over what you have negotiated with the seller. They will change the terms of the deal any way they want, any time they want. If your money has gone hard and, and you know, you're still waiting for approval from the bank, tough luck. Your money has gone hard. And if the bank comes back later and decides to change the economic terms, even though it says in the note document that they can, they either have to assume, allow the assumption up or down, they will not allow it. To, they, they can come back in and change the economic terms. Let me, let me rephrase that because I don't think I said that well enough. The note document will say that the property, that, that the mortgage can be assumed. And it'll also say that it can only be assumed if without any changing of the economic terms of the note. And that's supposed to give the seller some protection in the event that he, the bank decides to change the terms. Well, guess what happens? The bank will change the terms regardless. I don't, you know, it, 
you can sit there and say, oh, no, no, that'll never happen. I'm telling you right now, it happened to me. If the bank feels as though you're not, you don't have enough skin in the game because of the negotiating, they're going to come back and make you put more skin in the game. I'll give you a perfect example. What happens if you negotiate a deal with this Bristol and the deal is, um, you know, the mortgage is $6 million and you guys negotiate a purchase price of $6.6 million. That means you've got to come to the table with $600,000. $600,000, holy cow, you just negotiated a great deal. You're buying 211 units of Class A property, and you only have to come up with $600,000. Wow, congratulations, guys. And you're assuming the existing note in place at 3.86 interest rate. Man, I want in on that deal. That's a smoking hot deal. Bravo. And then you sit down and you start going through the assumption process to get approved for the assumption. And the bank looks at the purchase and sale and realizes, wait a minute, these guys are only into the deal for six for uh, six hundred thousand dollars. That's not even ten percent. We want them to be in for twenty. Okay, uh, Mr. Buyer, you're going to need to come to the table with another uh, two million dollars. You're like, what, what are you talking about? Is, I'm not coming up with two million. I don't have to. It's six hundred thousand dollars. That's our deal. Well, then you're not going to be approved for the assumption. Well, no. And in our case, we were approved contingent upon bringing more money to the table. And we argued with the bank, said, you are adding an economic term that is in violation of the terms of the agreement. And you know what the bank said? Oh, then you're not approved. No, you just said we're approved. Yes, and congratulations. I'm telling you right now, folks, the, uh, the deal with an assumption is there's a third person at the negotiating table, and it is not your friend. So you've got to leave yourself outs when you're dealing with uh, an assumption. And let me show you how you're going to do it. All right. Uh, on the resources and archives section is a um, is an LOI. Oh, let me get to you here. Is an LOI. I'm going to blow this up a little bit for the elderly. And that's not a slam on anyone. All right. Let me show you what happens here. Note this right here. It's Assumption LOI, this template does not have wording discussing the reserve funds that should be depleted or transferred by seller at closing. If you do not understand this, seek competent legal advice. If you need any advice in how to draft that, you come see me. I will uh, put it together for you and you can get it to your attorney for review. What that means is that in the LOI, you are going to tell the guy that he, if he's got any money in the reserve funds, he's either got to spend it before the closing or he's going to give it to you. But that money does not walk at the closing table. It stays in the property. So that's the key, one key you must add to an, L, uh, an assumption LOI. Now, let me show you the other key that you need to add. Everything in here is just like your standard LOI, purchase price, inspection period, earnest money, a purchase agreement. Now, check this out. This paragraph right here must be in all of your assumption deals. It says, in the event written approval of the lender to the loan assumption is not obtained in writing on or before the 60 days after the effective date. Now, why do we choose 60 days? Because that should be the amount of time that the financing contingency lasts for. And as you can see in this particular offer, we don't even have, the, yep, there it is. Uh, finance with a purchase obligation to purchase property shall be subject to the purchase of receiving finance terms and conditions picks within 60 days after the effective date, okay? So you're going to make sure that mirror is the same. So 60 days after the effective date, or if the lender notifies the seller or the purchaser of its disapproval of the loan assumption, and so long as the purchaser has supplied all the requested information to the lender and used best efforts to obtain lender approval, the purchaser, you, may terminate this contract by written notice to seller and all of the earnest money shall be returned to the purchaser. And neither party shall thereafter have any obligations one to the other except the obligations which, which expressly survive termination of this contract. If the lender approves the loan assumption but imposes economic requirements as an additional financial obligation of the purchaser, then the purchaser shall advise the seller of such requirement and the two of them shall attempt in good faith to figure out who's responsible for such obligation between them, failing which the purchaser may terminate this contract by written notice and get all his earnest money back. You see, what happens is if your money's going to go hard, but if your money goes hard and then after it goes hard, the bank says, oh, we changed our mind, we're going to do things differently. If that happens, you get your money back. 
if you do not have this clause in there and you go hard and the bank decides they want you to put $2 million more down, you can't walk or you lose your money. That's why you've got to have this wording in that LOI. Okay? Two things must be in an LOI, uh, an assumption LOI. This paragraph and a beneficial paragraph benefiting you about the uh, reserve replacement money. Okay? So when you look at LOI, guys, don't think off the top of your head, like, oh, this is all great. Let me just see if I can find some more uh, information here. This is a beautiful property, by the way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I'm not, not really telling much more about the... Um... Oh, here we go. This is uh, well, mortgage interest. So here they're telling you more about the deal, about the debt. Um, yeah, let's see. Also, let's see. They've actually done a nice job here putting the information in there about the Fannie Mae loan. Um, yeah, look at the current balance. That should tell you. Uh, and this is something they took out in November. So if that's, a, that's when the balance started mortgage constant as of November. Uh, let me see. This when you look at these properties that are telling you that that um, you know the the uh, purchase price is, is dependent upon the market. Uh, when you look at the debt instrument, you figure out when they took out the note and how much they put down. That should give you an idea of what the bank considers this property to be worth. Uh, so that's a good kind of jumping off point uh, to try to figure out whether you can whether the numbers work or not. Um, so that's really it. That's uh, that's it regarding the assumption, um, guys. I'm telling you, I don't like them. I'll do them. I will work with you through them. Uh, but you have to understand that it is done. Uh, it has to be done to your benefit. Otherwise, you know, the seller is not doing you any favors when it comes to a uh, loan assumption. All right, I got a couple questions here. There's, yeah, so I'm coming in for a landing here. Uh, if anybody has any questions, go right. Uh, okay, can the seller take care of the third-party bank when we work the LOI? Uh, I don't know what you mean by the third-party bank. Can the seller take care of them? Well, the problem is a seller is the seller has given up his negotiation rights when he went into this deal a year before. He basically said, "I agree. The only way I'm going to get out of this deal is if I have find some sucker that I can, uh, you know, pass it off to that I can assign this note to." And so he has really given up his uh, ability to negotiate uh, any, any of those prepayment penalties. And let me tell you some folks, those prepayment penalties are huge. That's why they're forced to find somebody to assume the note. Because if they had to pay those prepayment penalties, their, their return uh, on their investment would, would be more than cut in half in some cases. So you definitely want to, um, you know, you got to realize that, that the bank and the bank's in the driver's seat and the bank's the guy who's not in the driver's seat is the seller and if he thinks he's in the driver's seat he's making a huge mistake you need to be in the driver's seat you need to always remain in control of the deal and that means that when you go in to make an offer you put these two paragraphs in there and you can control this deal uh, right up until you need to either either fish or cut bait uh, can a term be included in the LOI to have a seller make good the extra requirements of the bank and the assumption? Yes. And as a matter of fact, that is what this says. Can 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 we put this back on the seller? Uh, that if the bank comes back and wants something, can this become the seller's responsibility? And yet, and, and it essentially is done right here. And neither party shall thereafter have any obligation. Oh, no, that's not it. Uh, let me see. Um, but impose... Uh, and seller and purchaser shall attempt in good faith to allocate the responsibility for such, such obligation between, between them, failing which purchaser may terminate this contract. Now, you know, you could write this and say, well, if he comes back, it's all on the seller. But remember, we're trying to get this guy to a yes. We're trying to get this guy to, to accepting the terms of our LOI. We want to go under contract with this property. So what we do is we write the LOI in such a way that it, that it's fair down the middle, but it gives you as the as the, as the buyer huge negotiation uh, negotiating ability to get out of the deal or put it back on the seller. So that's why we've written this particular phrase this way, 
is because our number one goal is to sell the offer. Once we get the offer accepted, then you know we're we're good to uh, uh, we're good to rock and roll. We're good to go back and negotiate other terms. But if he never accepts the offer, you know we it's like I always say, this is nothing more than a very expensive hobby. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let me see. Okay, this this guy's got tons of questions. What it means from where I stand is that this seller needs to get out as he ought to have taken this into account, right? Well, no. See what happens. Why does a seller take this deal and, um, and run with it? Because think about the terms of this deal when the seller took, took this on. They were waving you know, $6 million in front of this guy with phenomenal terms. 3.86% interest rate, that's the best thing out there. 30-year amortization, that's fantastic. And then the number one thing that everybody wants, non-recourse. If this thing fails, the guy just walks. So those three things make this a very attractive mortgage. And that's what everybody wants. That's why this seller thinks that he's got, you know, he's, he's the prettiest girl in the whole trailer park. Because he's got this Fannie Mae alone. And it and it's it's got great terms, but remember, it's got huge defeasance penalties, and as soon as you take this on, they become your problem. So that's the issue. I mean, the, the thing is that if if a guy holds on to a uh, an assumption too long, he really hurts himself because the value of his property has grown so much, and the debt keeps coming down that you know he's looking at a percent LTV deal and that's that's tough to sell that's a huge amount of money down in order to make the money uh, make it happen so that's why you're seeing a lot of these assumptions come up on new money on new debt um, but you just got to remember always remain in control of the deal that's the key that is definitely the key all right, folks, if there are no more questions, if there are any questions, you know, just shoot me an email at info at multifamilyinvestingacademy.com, and uh, this particular uh, webinar will be up on the um, uh, website uh, later today. I know probably by tomorrow. Uh, I have the uh, owner's forum uh, in the next, uh, at 6 o'clock, for, for, uh, the first owner's forum. That will be a lot of fun. Um, that is where... You're coaching. You get put on uh, multifamily uh, coaching on steroids. Uh, I'm going to be your uh, your uh, your worst coach, your worst nightmare, because we're going to get deals done. Uh, anyone in the owners forum.